all helped me, you know, I was so focused on getting an orchestral job. It was all I wanted. I didn't really, I didn't have a great interest in playing concertos and, and I just wanted to play Beethoven V and Heldenleben and, you know, that's all I ever wanted to do. And, and he helped me open my brain. <laughs> We are chatting today with Caitlin Kaminga, who has had one of the most fascinating careers I've ever heard of. I can't wait to share this with you. I'm Jason Heath. Welcome to Contrabass Conversations. And Caitlin has had the most fantastic path through the music world. She started off playing in the Louisiana Philharmonic, a student of Paul Ellison's, by the way. We'll talk about Paul and much more in this episode. So, Caitlin, her first job was in the Louisiana Philharmonic, where she, by the way, also played with Susan Cahill, another recent podcast guest. She went on to play in the Hong Kong Philharmonic, took the assistant principal double bass position, then in the BBC National Orchestra of Wales, and after a few years there, moved to London, where she was playing with the London Philharmonic, Philharmonia, London Mozart players, many other groups. And then she decided to take this job in Trinidad and Tobago. So we dig into why, how, the logistics, what she's up to now, so many great topics. And you'll be hearing some music from some of her projects over there. We've got links to everything that she's up to in the show notes, and you can check out her website, CaitlinCaminga.org. We've got some great sponsors for this episode, Diderio Strings, Upton Bass, and the Bass Violin Shop, and more on them later. Caitlin and I were chatting on FaceTime, and we had a couple connectivity blurps and blobbles and that sort of thing, so if we cut in and out a little bit, you'll still get the gist of what we're talking about. Such a great conversation. And we start off with, why was orchestra playing suddenly not enough anymore. She'd done so much. Why take this next step and look at this job at Trinidad and Tobago? You were on that trajectory, you know, moving through all those jobs, and then suddenly it was not enough. Like, why wasn't it enough? Can you can you talk about that? Well, I've I've wondered that myself. Part of it, I think, was just that I had done so much at such a high level that I mean, I think it happens to a lot of orchestral musicians that you know you get to. A, I got to a point where I was looking at the season coming up and. A couple of conductors were exciting and, you know, a couple of Mueller symphonies, but most of it I'd, I'd done before. And I'm somebody who likes to keep things new and fresh. And, you know, I mean, most interesting orchestral musicians at some point in their career start branching off and doing other things, whether that's chamber music or teaching or, um, I mean, the first thing that I really started to focus on was writing. Um, and I'm not a composer, but I, I started writing short stories and I, I um, started playwriting and I found this whole kind of community of writers in Cardiff that was just a really great separate branch. But I think it was also that was I, I was a first time mother at a later age than a lot of a lot of women. And I think part of it was also just being a new mother and just feeling like my focus changed a little bit in terms of I, I really wanted to be involved in community. So it was kind of a combination of those things of, of just feeling like I wanted to be artistically challenged more um, because, you know, you get a, get to a point in kind of the whole audition thing where, you know, there's a better paying job out there and there might be a better position but really, for the most part, you can have the most amazing job on the planet and, and not have great colleagues, or you can have a really incredible colleague and not the best orchestra. But the fact of the matter is we're still going to play the same repertoire for the most part. So she decided to look at this opportunity, pursue it. What did she talk about in the interview? That's what we dig into next. I just talked all about that and about the different things that I wanted to do and create and collaborate with. And, and they just seemed incredibly supportive by it. In addition to being in a position to, to really start something, um, which is not for every personality. 
but for my personality, uh, it's perfect. So, so I feel like everything that I do there has meaning and it has the opportunity for longevity and sustainability if I do it right. There's never been anybody that taught double bass formally in Trinidad. And so I feel like, you know, every bass that I come across, but, you know, a lot of them that come to me have, are, are electric bass players. And so it's creating a program uh, relevant to the country and helping them choose repertoire that would be interesting. Also encouraging them to be arrangers and composers and and you know, just start their own tradition for their own country. And it's just been a really fascinating experience for me. I've also been incredibly supported by my boss, uh, Kwame Ryan, who's he's a Trinidadian that was schooled in London. He's a fine double bass player. But he's also, uh, he, his career path has been as a conductor. The last position he held was as music director of the Bordeaux Symphony. So he's kind of the best of both worlds of Europe and Trinidad. The composition that we've got today is called Rainforest. What are some of the sounds that, that the audience might hear in the rainforest today? They might hear the, they might hear the cuscadi, the monkeys, the snake, the frog, and the mosquito. <laughs> She took the plunge. She moved to Trinidad and Tobago. What was that experience like coming from London and now being in Trinidad and Tobago? We dig into that next. But first, I'd like to give a shout out to our sponsor, Diderio Strings. And we're talking this month about Zyx Strings, which I've used on my bass. Very cool strings. And what goes into those Zyx Strings exactly? Here's Lyris Hung, Orchestral Strings Product Manager at D'Addario, with a little bit about Zyx Strings and what's in that core. They fall into mostly what's called a multi-filament, and that just means lots of filaments, <laughs> many filaments. Uh, so it's like a bundle of um, fibers, basically, like plastic fibers. Visually, it resembles something like a bunch of, of doll's hair, you know, like a bunch of very fine pieces of thin, thin plastic kind of bundled together. You can learn more at ContraraceConversations.com slash strings. And thank you for sponsoring the podcast, D'Addario. Okay, back to our conversation with Caitlin and the experience of landing in Trinidad and Tobago. We'd been kind of trading off tours and one or none of us was bringing the kids up and Esapeka was doing a, a Mahler cycle and we were at Athens and we were at the base of the Acropolis and and you know, I think we had all of you know 22 hours in Athens and I and I I'd never been there and so I you know in between the rehearsal and the concert I, I sprinted up to the top of the Acropolis just to, you know quick get in there at the top of the the, the Acropolis my phone rang. And it was the London Philharmonic calling to see if I if I wanted to go on tour to Australia. <laughs> and it was just about the time we were supposed to be going. Uh, and so I called up my husband and I said, you don't mind if I like squeeze in a little tour to Australia? Do you, before we? <laughs> and he said, come home now. <laughs> 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 but so, I mean, our life was crazy. But yes, then then we landed in Trinidad and Paul. I mean, it, in some ways, it looks like the Sydney Opera House what they've built. It's a big spaceship uh, right on the the savannah, which is this huge central park of kind of three or four miles in circumference, and it's right on the edge of that. A big, beautiful building with a huge hall, um, and then the, there's two pods on the side that are where the university is housed, and there's two small concert halls inside there, one of which is largely used by the theater department and then the other that is used by the music department and that's where we put on our chamber series but this, this building hadn't been built and so i you know we'd had this wild move you know from from london and, and i in the meantime i'd gone to chautauqua and I, my little boy was only a year old um so i had a one-year-old and a four-year-old and man we landed in port of spain and the sent the boys to school and it was like <laughs> you know <laughs> wow what have we done? Oh, my gosh. It's been a fantastic thing to communicate with each um, one of them. 
to put all our ideas together to make one fantastic piece of music together. I like to be a musician or a doctor for music. I like that the violin, how, how it's like a famous instrument that I get to play it. Me, Shane and Nikki. I feel proud of it because I feel proud of myself. Well, I've always dreamed about being a magician, but not playing a viola. There are a lot of unexpected things coming from London to a place like Trinidad and Tobago. Here are a few more from Caitlin. We have tarantulas that live in the house. <laughs> oh, okay. That's not, that, that, that's unexpected. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I think uh, it's, it's unexpected how open armed we've been embraced with our chamber music series and how mm-hmm. um, I think partly because we have, an unsophisticated audience as opposed to a semi-sophisticated audience. We don't have to play Mozart. We can play anything and, and people will have their own just natural reaction to it. And I think because it's so different from anything else that's going on, it's just this calm, you know, you come and sit in this nice space and just listen to some music that's unfamiliar and just, we've just been so embraced I didn't know that that was going to be the case. I'll tell a great story. My the, the the first kind of six months at the at the boys' school, so Tyler was four. No, he was five. And I wondered, you know, what it was going to be like for him being the only blondie in the class. You know, so the first day of school, I was kind of checking in, and not, you know, nothing. And about six months later, he says to me, "You know, how many times do we have to go to the beach for me to have the same color skin as Nicholas?" <laughs> And I said, oh, honey, you know, it's never going to be that brown. But I said, you know, isn't it? You know, when you go to the ice cream shop and sometimes you want vanilla, sometimes you want strawberry and sometimes you want chocolate. And he said, no, mommy, I only want chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> this University of Trinidad and Tobago, it's only 10 years old. And the Academy of Performing Arts that Caitlin teaches at, that's only six years old. It's incredible what she has done and what they are doing at the university in the arts. The creative projects she's up to are staggering. In 2014, she did a world premiere of A Soldier's Tale, which is by Stravinsky, of course, and this is authored by Caitlin. She also did River of Freedom, which is an interdisciplinary work about the African-American slaves who fought with the British in exchange for freedom and land in Trinidad. This was premiered in May 2015 and narrated by Caitlin. This work was underwritten by matching grants from the United States Embassy to Trinidad and Tobago and the Vincent Wilkinson Foundation. And she has done musical postcards, which is a collaboration with none other than John Deke of B.B. Wolf fame. And this is a collaboration with young bassists in Trinidad. And these excerpts we've been playing throughout, that's from this collaboration called Rainforest. So what do musicians do in Trinidad and Tobago? They get trained. What are the opportunities like for them? Here's Caitlin on what some of these opportunities look like. What options are people finding uh, that are studying music in Trinidad? What do they, what do they end up uh, exploring? Well, I'll tell, you about, I'll tell you about one of my, one of my favorite students because um, he's just about to have and do this, this great uh, set of internships. He was a young man that came to me on electric bass that wanted to learn upright. Not the most amazing uh, bass player on the planet, but he's just a chilled out guy, loves music, and he's interested in a lot of different things. They piece together their lives the, the way all all musicians do. You know, and there isn't a symphony. There, there is a symphony orchestra, but it's not a full time symphony orchestra. It's it's more like a community orchestra and it pays a little bit of money and he plays in that and then you know he's got a um he teaches strings at the school where my boys go which is uh kind of the arty farty school and <laughs> just outside of port of spain and but then he this other project that i started was with uh luthier sans frontier luthiers without borders um which if you don't know this organization it's a great one to to know about um, Paul Ellison actually hooked me up with them. Not long after I landed in Trinidad, I realized that a scene had opened up with my base. And I was like, there's nowhere, there's nowhere to take it. Right, right. <laughs> and, and I don't know how to do it. And I, I had to fly to Toronto with a seam. <laughs> you know? And luckily the insurance paid for it. But, you know, it was very expensive. And 
Um, and then I was like, where am I going to get my bow here? I got to fly to Miami to get my bow here. This is nuts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so my two favorite sources, the U.S. Embassy and First Citizens Bank, they're, they're, they've just been incredibly generous with, with uh, funding. And I find with, with uh, you know, those kind of organizations, once they find somebody that, that comes through, mm -hmm. they tend to, to keep funding. Um, but so the uh, first time they came over, it was these two women that run the American chapter of Luthiers Without Borders. And as long as you kind of pay for their airfare and accommodation, they'll come over with all of their tools and do free work. So the first time they came, you know, I didn't really know what I was doing. And I just kind of put the word out and said, if you need repairs and, you know, bring it in, we're going to be doing this. At, and they kind of had an, um, an open table in the, the foyer at the, the university um, so people could kind of see what they were doing. And, and then kind of on the last day, we were in a little mini workshop on kind of instrument maintenance. Um, and then we started brainstorming together, you know, I housed them and fed them, and uh, and then the, the, the bank paid for their flights. And I said, wouldn't it be cool if we kind of figured out a way for this to become, you know, a teaching opportunity? This summer, a few students from Trinidad and Tobago actually came to the United States to work in a couple of different shops and get some hands-on experience with this Luthiers Without Borders program. And here are the long-term goals Caitlin sees with getting these students that experience through Luthiers Without Borders. You know, with the long-term goal that maybe we find a couple that were talented and interested and would want to open up a shop. We've now been doing that for, for five years. And two students in particular, a viola student and a bass student, that have really shown great promise um, in instrument repair. And then another viola student that's shown great promise with bow repairs and bow uh, repairs. Working together to create a piece is absolutely a great start for our future. How I feel is absolutely unexplainable. So all I can say for now is, oh my God. <laughs> Caitlin, like all of us, has had so many great influences and mentors in her life. And she and I, we dug into two people in particular, and we're going to finish off the episode with these two people. But before we do that, I'd like to give a shout out to Upton Bass and Mark Ramirez, former podcast guest, Mark over in Lisbon, Portugal. He had Upton make a copy of his beautiful Cavani bass. Here's a little bit about that project. I do a lot of uh, moving around and giving master classes and stuff like this. I had a, a copy made of it by uh, by the Uptons, by Gary and uh, Eric Roy uh, at the Upton at the Upton shop. Um, they made a copy of it, but they made an even smaller copy. I think it's a seven eighths copy of the bass. Uh, I use it now. I use that bass for my solo playing, mm -hmm. uh, which which I do a lot. Recently, I've been doing a lot, especially here, and it has a detachable neck. The detachable neck, man, I tell you, in Europe, it's the craze. Learn more about what Upton's up to, including removal necks and much more at UptonBase.com. And thank you so much to the Bass Violin Shop, which offers rentals. If you can't get a copy made and a removable neck of your bass, but you're doing some traveling, check out BassViolinShop.com, and they offer rental options for seasoned musicians or first-timers. If you're traveling the Carolinas and you need a bass, they are the people to connect you. Check them out at BassViolinShop.com, and thanks for sponsoring the podcast. So one of Caitlin's early teachers was James Clute. Jim Clute of the Minnesota Orchestra. He's come up on the podcast from time to time. Scott Pingle studied with him. Lots of folks studied with him if they came from that part of the United States. I studied with him in high school, made the three-hour drive to Minneapolis to get some lessons with Jim. Quite a character. These were very memorable lessons, and Caitlin and I share some of our memories of studying with Jim. I love that you started with that, that Jim, Jim Clute was your first teacher, you said. You know, that yeah. I, I studied with Jim Clute uh, oh, in oh. high school. I grew up in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. So Minneapolis was the nearest big city to go to. And I would drive the three and a half hours and take some lessons. That's great. <laughs> I, I wrote a play uh, four years ago called Bases Are Loaded. Uh huh. That, um, that actually got a, a staged reading at Chautauqua, which was very cool. But I based one of the 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 people um 
one of the characters on Jim, Jim. And I don't know if, did you have lessons at his house? I did. There were these big dogs at the house. That was like, Prescott, I, yeah. <laughs> but, but my, well, actually Prescott was probably an earlier one. You're, yeah. you're younger than me. <laughs> but uh, my very first lesson in high school with Jim was going up and down that staircase. <laughs> and it was, there was the stained glass window at the bottom. And then you go, we went around and there was that naked woman tapestry with she had, I can remember it was like a little acorn that stuck out on her nipple. <laughs> <laughs> and then you went up into that giant, you know, and he sat in the throne behind that mahogany desk. And there was, was a boxini above the fireplace. I think so. I, 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 you're taking me back like many decades. <laughs> you know, and I, and like that little music stand you were standing behind just was never big enough <laughs> I, I just wanted it to be a little bigger because he had that he was so gruff and mm-hmm. you know and then you figure out he's a big teddy bear mm-hmm. and I he was one of my hugest supporters over the years and in addition to James Clute, somebody that Caitlin worked with that's had a huge influence on her life, and he's come up a couple times in the episode already, including the opening quote, is, of course, Paul Ellison, who so many past podcast guests have studied with. And I can't help but when a former Paul student or current Paul student is on the show, I have to ask them what their experience was studying with Paul. And Caitlin has a wonderfully eloquent description of her experiences with Paul here it is. What I would say about Paul is that that I wouldn't be employed today if, if I hadn't met him. I had some really great teachers before him, but that I mean, Jim Clue is an amazing person to start with. Uh, and then I studied with Brad Upland and Warren Benfield. And Brad, I, I think, at you know, he was old, he was just starting to teach. And the thing I learned the most from him was was I, I just always try to emulate his sound. He's he's got just the most amazing organ sound. And 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 Warren Benfield, I got kind of a crash course in the literature, but you know zero on technique. And it, you know we used to laugh about the Warren Benfield orchestral fingering. I I treasure those those lessons I had with him because. He walked me through the entire orchestral literature, even though I wasn't ready to, to play it yet, <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, in a lot of ways. But what Paul did was Paul broke me down and he put me back together. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I spent a whole year on just playing scales and arpeggios and um, and learning how to hold the bow properly and, and play spiccato. And if he hadn't done that for me, I, I just I wouldn't be employed. Um, and he, Paul helped me, you know, I was so focused on getting an orchestral job. It was all I wanted. I didn't really, I didn't have a great interest in playing concertos. And, and I just wanted to play Beethoven 5 and Helen Leben. And, mm-hmm. you know, that's all I ever wanted to do. And, and he helped me open my brain <laughs> to, you know, like the, the whole life is not going to be orchestral excerpts. And and he, the thing about Paul is that he, he was more than a bass teacher. He was a mentor. You know, he's uh, he's into Eastern philosophy and, and, you know, good nutrition and exercise. And, um, you know, he was he was perfect for me. Caitlin, thank you so much for chatting. So great to have you on the show. Folks, check out everything she's up to at her website, CaitlinKaminga.org. And that's going to do it for this episode of Contrabass Conversations. I'm having such a blast connecting with folks like Caitlin. I have such a good time. I learn so much. It's a activity that I just get so much joy and satisfaction and inspiration from and that you listen to it just means so much to me. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Find us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, wherever you hang out, we're probably there. Get on our email list and get the latest double bass news and tips and tricks and techniques and all that sort of stuff. That's all available at our website, ContrabassConversations.com. And send me a message. I'd love to hear from you. Feedback at ContrabassConversations.com will put you in touch with me and I respond to each and every message I get. It brings me such joy to hear from you and know that you're listening to this show and digging it. And I love hearing where people are from in different parts of the world. So cool to talk with Caitlin, who's in Trinidad and Tobago now. And I hear from people 
all across the globe, all continents, except I don't think I've heard from Antarctica, but maybe I will soon. If you're listening to Antarctica, reach out and let me know. That's going to do it for this episode. Thanks again, and we will see you soon for more life in the low end of the spectrum. 